Well, I wanted to start our time together today by telling you one of the weirdest experiences I've ever had. Um, I had just begun a semester in Ireland. So in college, I had the privilege of going to Ireland. It was not a road trip. We took an airplane there. And so we were getting settled in. It was the very first day I'd arrived. And I was kind of thinking to myself, what in the world am I doing here, right? I mean, what is this going to be like? What, are, what am I looking forward to? I stayed at this really cool place. In fact, I got a picture of it here. Um, this is the building where I stayed, and then the Irish Sea was like a stone's throw away. In fact, there's another picture of the Irish Sea here. You can see the dinghies along the beach and stuff. I mean, it was just this awesome place that we're experiencing. So I'm out in the street. I'm kind of taking it all in, just looking around, and then a van came driving down the road, and I look at this van, and I kid you not, you're going to think I'm making this up. I'm absolutely not. There was a dog driving the van. Like there's a dog in the driver's seat, human in the passenger seat. And I'm like, this is nuts, right? And I'm kind of freaking out for probably 20, 30 seconds. I'm like, what is going on here? What is this place I am living in? And then it dawned on me, I'm in a country where the steering wheel's on the opposite side of the car and the dog, as you know, in fact, was not driving the car. It was actually the human who was driving. But that thus began a semester of just trying to figure out that the rules of the road were a little bit different in Ireland, right? They weren't exactly the same. And, um, you know, it actually took about four months for me to learn that the school bus or the bus, it was a tour bus, not a school bus, but 13 years of living in the United States going to public schools taught me that the doors on the right side of the bus, but in Ireland it was on the opposite side. And I can't tell you the number of times I walked to the wrong side because it was so deeply ingrained into me, the rules of the road here in the United States. So more on that here in just a second. But we're in the middle of this series called Road Trip. If you're with us for the first time, welcome. We're so glad you're with us. If you're watching online, engaging with us online, thank you for being a part of our church family today. We're so glad you're here. This series is kind of a, a random series throughout the summer because we know people are going to be on their own road trips. So we're just kind of taking a road trip together as a church family. And today we're talking about the rules of the road. And the thing about the rules of the road is that the rules of the road differ depending on where you are, right? Whether you're in another country, the speed limit signs, I mean, they look different. The on-off ramps look different. Uh, here in the United States, even the states, our states have different rules. Those of you who grew up here in Indiana, you may not know this, but we transplants had to actually take a test in order to get an Indiana driver's license. Now, I grew up in Ohio, had to take the test to get the Ohio license. That makes sense. Moved to South Carolina, they just give you a license, right? They don't care. They give you a license. Moved to Indiana, they hand you a book and say, you've got to study this book and take a driver's test. And I just got to come clean with you. I took the test and I missed a question. And I asked the lady because she says, okay, well, you passed, but you missed one. And I said, well, which one did I miss? And she said, oh, I can't tell you that. Because <laughs> we'd rather keep you guessing about our laws rather than helping you understand how to avoid getting in an accident or whatever. I mean, just crazy. Anyway, that's government bureaucracy at its finest, right? It doesn't make any sense. So anyhow, you know, you understand this. We've got different rules. You're allowed to turn right on red here. You can make U-turns. Uh, different states, you can't pump your own gas. You have to have an attendant pump the gas for you. There's the Michigan left, which is the most bizarre rule I have ever heard of, which makes sense it would originate in Michigan. Um, no offense to you Michiganders. But I mean, we've got all kinds of rules, different rules for the road. And then something else to kind of set up our conversation for today is that the rules of the road don't dictate where to go, they dictate how to go. They don't tell you you have to go to the mountains or the beach, but they tell you how to go about getting there, how to obey the speed limits, how you're allowed to turn or not turn, what you do in a construction zone, what you do in a school zone. They are less about the destination than they are about the journey. And so they allow for the uniqueness of the driver, right? I mean, they allow us to not be robots, but to make our own decisions, to go where we want to go, but to do it with certain laws. And they, they, they lean into this common understanding that we all have, that we want to get there safely, right? We want to get there all in one piece. We don't want another driver to be oppressive to us. We don't want chaos, right? We all want to be able to get where it is that we're going without a whole lot of heartache. Now I say all that, again, th this isn't actually about cars and roads and things like that. There is a parallel here that I want to talk about, and that is that we each have rules of the road in life. And again, they're less about the destination than they are about the journey. They're less about where we're going than they are about how we get here or how we get there, rather. And these are true for us, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, whether somebody invited you to church and you're just kind of exploring the whole faith thing. There are rules for the road that we all have in life. Let me give you a few examples. Um, I've discovered that there are two types of people in the world. You don't have to own up to this, but there are some people whose cars look like this. 
I've seen these. I know they're real. And there are some whose cars look like this, right? And then maybe you're like me and you're somewhere in between. Or when it comes to politics, sometimes there are rules of the road with politics. There are certain TV stations we watch, right? It could be in your family or in your home you watch this station, or it could be you watch this station. Or it could be that you don't even talk about politics at all because it's so controversial and that's too stressful. And in your family, you know, you don't want to have stress. You just want a peaceful, even keeled sort of thing. Or, you know, there are rules for the road of how we engage with one another, how we have disagreements or arguments. Sometimes it could be that you're a shouting match family and you like to yell and shout. Maybe you're the silent treatment family where you just kind of cross your arms and nobody's going to talk to you. Or, or maybe you're the sit down and let's have a heart to heart conversation family, right? I mean, we all just, we just have different rules for the road and we could go on and on and on. We, you get the point. The rules are less about the destination than they are about the journey. They're less about where than they are about how. But the question I want you to think about this morning is where did your rules originate? Where did they come from? The way that you operate in life, did it come from your parents? Did it come from your friends? Did it come from your church? Did it come from the Bible? Did it come from what you see on television? Did it come from feeling guilty because of something that you've done? I mean, where, where did the rules of the road originate? Who taught you what you should value in life? Who taught you your version of morality? Who taught you what should be right and what should be wrong? Who taught you where to think or how to think as it comes to politics? Who taught you what to do with your anger? Who taught you whether or not you should forgive? Who taught you what you should do as a parent? Who taught you what kind of entertainment to enjoy? Where did your rules come from? And are they worthwhile? Do they help you know what to do when you come across the inevitable things in life, like the road construction or the bridge that's out or you know, the, the accident that took place? Do they help you to know how to handle the difficulties and the challenges that you find in life? Where do they come from? Are they worthwhile? And is it possible, and I'm going to kind of show you my cards here, is it possible that there is a universal set of principles a universal set of principles that we can actually lean our lives into that give us direction and instruction as we go throughout life. And my answer to that question is, yes, there is a universal set of principles. And it's not surprising, right? We're in church. I'm a pastor, right? I talk about the Bible every week. I mean, so, so obviously I'm going to come at this from that kind of point of view, but I want to invite you into a space of just thinking about the principles that we have and think about why God may have given us principles. In fact, I was thinking about this on my drive this morning about, you know, how many um, things in my life, regrets that I have could have been avoided if I had understood the why behind the principles that God gave me. Because so often we look at scripture, we look at the Bible as a list of can'ts, cannots, rather than a list of cans. We look at it as restrictions rather than freedoms, we don't look at it as principles, but the thing about a principle is you don't break a principle, you break yourself against a principle. And so as we begin to understand the motivation behind the things that we find in scripture, we discover that there is a God who actually isn't trying to control us, but a God who is actually for us. And so I want to pause and, uh, and talk about that today. Before we get to it, we're going to be in the book of Psalms. If you have a Bible, you brought it along, you may want to turn there. If you have an app, you can turn in Psalms. Um, and I'll tell you where here in just a minute. But I want to also acknowledge that you may be in here today and you're, you know, you're kind of new to the whole church thing, God thing. You're not even sure what you believe thing. And you're like, Seth, you know, I know where you're going. You're going to talk about how the Bible, blah, 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 you know, the Bible, blah, blah, blah. And I just want you to know that I've had a lot of friends over the years who have maybe felt the same way you may feel about that. And so I want to invite you to lean into a quote I found a couple weeks ago um, on a guy that I follow on Twitter who, who said something that has just kind of been messing around with me. But here's what he said. He said, regardless of what you believe about the Bible, what can't be denied is that the Bible nails the truth about human nature. Regardless of what you believe about the Bible, whether you think it's true or whether you don't, what can't be denied is the Bible nails the truth about human nature and our deceptive human hearts, said Frank Turek, Dr. Frank Turek. And you know, when you think about it, essentially what he's saying is, look, the times change, the people change, the stories change, but really the problems are always the same. 
which is why you can turn on any episode of Days of Our Lives or General Hospital, and it's essentially the same storyline you saw three months ago. So I've been told, I've never watched those, but I've seen enough drama shows like This Is Us to know that there are only a few storylines that just get repeated and rewritten and repeated and rewritten, and it's the exact same thing. And the truth is, as you've thumbed through the pages of Scripture, if you spend time reading it, you'll discover that God really does have a pulse. I mean, Scripture has a pulse on the deceptive nature of human nature. It nails the truth about our human nature and our deceptive human hearts. But then the other thing, for those of us in the room who are, who are followers of Jesus and who would say, you know, we believe the Bible, you know, it's true, you know, I believe the Bible, how about you? You know, and, and we love the Bible, you know. The thing is, so many of us, you know, we have an awkward relationship with it. Because you may say, yeah, I love the Bible, it's so good, it's so true, it's God's truth. But when it comes to your day-to-day life, Maybe you don't have any kind of interaction with it. In fact, it could be that the only time you ever open the Bible is when you're here on church or here at church with us, or if you're preparing for community group, right? I mean, uh, you know, back in the day, Bibles used to be on coffee tables. I remember at my grandma's house, she had a really big Bible on the coffee table. It was the Holy Bible, and she she read it. But a lot of times, people didn't read it; they just dusted off because it was holy. You didn't want it to get dust on it. Um, but but people, you know, we have a mentality of yes, it's it's true, it's good, but I don't necessarily know what to do with it. In fact, I remember in high school talking to a youth leader once about how, you know, I wanted to read the Bible, but I just didn't know how, and it didn't make sense to me, and I wasn't exactly sure what to do with it. And so if that's you, I just, I hope you can lean in today because I I hope this is helpful as we think through exactly what the Bible is, how it really does nail the truth about our our human nature and our deceptive human hearts, but it gives us answers and it gives us a place to move forward. Because as I have grown older, as I have begun to study the Bible more and more, the thing that I've discovered is that there's actually an invitation in it. It's not a restriction. It's actually an invitation to live life to the full. And that's what the author of Psalm 119 discovered. Now, Psalm 119 is actually the longest chapter of the entire Bible. Of all the chapters of the Bible, it's the longest chapter. And so because it's so long, we don't have time to read every word of it today. But I'd encourage you after today, maybe this afternoon or later on in the week, to spend some time reading through it because it really does nail the truth about our human nature and our deceptive human heart. So, But we're going to jump in at verse 97. Here's what the author of Psalm 119 says, and it was most likely a guy, so I'll say him. He says, oh, how I love your law. Says nobody ever, right? I mean, oh, how I love your law. Have you ever felt that way? Oh, what a wonderful law. When you're driving down the road and you see that speed limit sign, do you say, thank you for that speed limit sign? Unless it's going up, right? Then it's like, thank you, I can finally speed up. But how often do we say, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it day and night. But have you ever thought what it would be like to live without laws? Without any, you know, just let's just talk about roads, because that's kind of the whole concept of the series, road trip. I mean, what would it be like if there were no laws on the road? It would be total chaos, right? In fact, a couple years ago, we took a mission trip to India, where I'm sure there are some laws, but man, it didn't feel like it. And we experienced this. That's actually not even a great picture of what we experienced. They were more like a family of eight huddled on a motorcycle, a single motorcycle with a lady carrying a baby. And you're looking at them thinking, Hmm, I'm not sure that's safe, right? I mean, it doesn't seem like that's a good idea, and yet that's kind of the result when we don't have laws. I mean, it's total chaos. People, I mean, what would happen if every time we went to a stoplight and it was red, people just ran it? How many accidents would there be? So you begin to look at laws and you begin to say, actually, these are for our benefit. As much as it feels like a restriction, it's actually to protect us, it's actually to watch over us. In fact, you young people who you know, feel like your parents just have all kinds of restrictions on you and the laws, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, all these rules all the time, you know, and it feels so oppressive. But could it be, because this is what happens when we break laws, we tend to look at the immediate rather than the ultimate. We think about where we are rather than where we're headed. And it could be that in your home, and certainly the case with myself and our home, and as I was growing up, the thing that you realize over time is that your parents were actually looking out for you. They're actually looking to your benefit rather than to your harm. That the rules of the road protect us from someone else's free will, if you will. I mean, you know, somebody running a red light, that's not a good thing. It creates a dangerous situation for yourself and others. 
So the psalmist realized that these laws weren't about restriction, but they were about freedom. And putting the scripture, we're going to stick that back up here. Oh, how I love your law, he says, because I realize that it's actually for my benefit. So I meditate on it all day long. And as I meditate on it, I begin to see the value of it. I begin to understand that it's actually good for me. And the key to meditating on it, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this here in a few minutes, is that over time, you know, we begin to recognize the real value that it has. And so I don't just know it, I actually do something with it. He goes on, he says this, he says, your commands or your rules for the road, you could say, you know, your precepts, your commands, they are always with me and they make me wiser than my enemies. Now throughout scripture, there's a uh, so what we call wisdom literature. The book of Proverbs is wisdom. Some of these psalms are wisdom. So this would be a wisdom psalm. And the idea is that a wise person understands what's right and chooses to do it. A wise person understands what's right and chooses to do it. A foolish person understands what's right and they choose not to do it. A um, simple person doesn't really know what's right and therefore can't do it. And then a mocker is somebody who just makes fun of those who do what's right. And so essentially, again, the psalmist is saying, look, I recognize your commands. They're with me. They make me wiser than my enemies. And because that, it gives me this competitive edge on life. It makes my life better. I understand the world more than those around me, not in an arrogant sort of way, but I've begun to understand how the world works. I've begun to understand your principles and why these principles lead to wise living. The point is that God's commands lead to wise living, which results in a better life. It results in life actually moving in a better direction. These are for my benefit. These are not a restriction. They are setting me free. He goes on, he says this, he says, I have more insight than all my teachers. The student surpasses the teacher. Why? For I meditate on your statutes. I spend time really thinking about them, allowing them to kind of wash over me, and then over time I apply them. He says, I have more understanding than the elders, the people who are older than I am. For what? For I, what's that word? Obey your precepts. Now, the word obey, I mean, you know, I don't know about you. It kind of takes me back to childhood or as a parent now, I say to my kids, are you obeying, right? I mean, and it's so like, you know, we don't want to obey. There's something within us, there's something within us that wants to push against the laws that are put out for us, unless you're a rules follower, which some of you may be, but many of us, you know, as we see rules, when we see that speed limit, it's like, okay, then how much faster can I go without getting caught? right? How much, what can I do to make it, you know, and, and, and nobody gets in trouble, right? I don't want to get in trouble, but, but the, the, the whole idea of obey is that I actually think about these things, I do something with them, and my life is better. And I'm not arrogant because of that. You're not arrogant because you stop at stoplights. You're wise <laughs> because you know not stopping at stoplights will result in disaster, The same idea is going on here. He goes on, he says this, he says, I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. Doing the right thing keeps me protected. I've kept my feet from every every evil path so that I might obey your word. That knowing the word and walking in the ways leads to protection. He goes on, he says, I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And then he continues, he says, I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Because as I've begun to understand your rules of of the road, as I've begun to look at your precepts, as I've begun to look at your laws, and they're all kind of synonymous in this context, As I've looked at those things, I've discovered a better way for my life. I hate every wrong path because I realize the wrong paths lead me in a not so good direction. Let me ask you a question. Really, it's kind of a two-parter. The first part is, have you ever gone down a wrong path before? And I know the answer to that, right? Whether it's a dating path, a relational path, whether it's a financial path or a work path. I mean, we've all, we've all, that was the whole point of our series back in May. We all fall down, right? We've all gone down a wrong path before. But here's the question. If you had put God's precepts, if you had put his laws or his rules for the road, his principles into practice, would it have kept you from going down the wrong path? I can honestly answer for myself and say, yes. 
Yes. That if I had followed God's principles, my life would have been better. That's the point of what he's saying. I gain understanding from your precepts. I hate every wrong path because I realize the damage that's been done in my life when I have not taken the right path. I've never actually regretted forgiving somebody. I've never regretted telling the truth. I've never regretted valuing God's view of morality. I've never regretted when I walk down his path. It's when I choose not to. It's when I choose not to that I discover pain along the way. And so the psalmist, I mean, he's kind of presenting these two paths. He's presenting this concept of of God's law and the value of God's law. He says, you know the best way to know the rules? The best way to know the rules is this. It's to meditate on them. The best way to know the rules of the road is to meditate on them. Now, the word meditate, it refers to a cow chewing its cud. You've probably seen that before with all their stomachs and stuff and getting, sucking all the nutrients out and preparing it to be able to go through all these stumps. I mean, they just chew, 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 until all those nutrients are sucked out. I mean, that's what a cow does. And the value then that comes from it is it's keeping it in front of your mind when you meditate on something, which is why as you're driving down the road, there isn't just one speed limit sign right? I mean, you drive down, there's another one a couple miles down the road, so you meditate on it, so it comes front and center, so you see it over and over and over again, and the hope is that as you see it over and over again, as you chew on that, you'll look at your speedometer and say, yeah, I should probably slow down. And the same is true as it comes to God's laws, his precepts, that when those situations come up, I'm tempted to be dishonest here in this situation, no, but I want to tell the truth because I know that that's going to lead me to a better relationship. Oh, I want to do this. But you know, the idea is that as you meditate on it, those come front and center, they begin to wash over you, that they are right in front of us. Which is why I believe he said what he said next, which it's a very famous verse of scripture. Perhaps you've read it before. He says this, he says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Now, my guess is you've probably walked around in the dark before because you didn't want to turn a light on to wake somebody up. Those of us with young kids, our kids leave stuff on the floor. And as you're walking around trying not to wake somebody up, you stub your toe or you step on a Barbie or a G.I. Joe or whatever it is. And it's like, ow, you know, it's painful. And so the author of the psalm here says, you know, look, your word, when I, when I carry your word with me, when I meditate on it, when it becomes a part of who I am, it's like a light on my path. And now the idea of this, or a lamp, you know, a lamp for my feet, is, he's talking about, it was like a Coleman lantern, right? They didn't have electricity back then, but you think about a lantern or a lamp that you would hang on a pole, and you'd carry it on a pole, and you'd walk around, and it would simply illuminate kind of a circle around you. And it wasn't a searchlight, it wasn't a spotlight, it didn't illuminate your entire journey, it didn't take you all the way to your destination. What it did was it illuminated the next step. And it helped you to see if there was something dangerous that you would potentially step on. Helped you to see the G.I. Joe or the Barbie on the ground. And that's the idea of what he's talking about. That when we meditate on, when we chew on, when we look at God's law as a moral guide for us, it's a light on our paths. Because we begin to understand the why behind it. Right? I mean, when you begin to understand the why of why be honest, right? I mean, well, let's just think about it. Would you like a dishonest police officer to pull you over? No, right? I mean, do you want to marry a liar? Do you hope that, it, or you, do you want to date a liar? Do you hope your kids just lie to you? Why? I mean, because we begin to understand that that's actually not good for us. It's not good for our relationships. It builds a wedge in our relationship. Or God says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, Why would he say that? Why would he say, don't stay angry overnight? Because he realizes that over time, undealt with anger that begins to control us. It begins to control our relationships. It creates distance in our relationships. Or why would he tell us to forgive one another? Because he understands that when we refuse to forgive one another, what happens? We become bitter. If you've ever met a person who's just holding unforgiveness, they are some of the most miserable people you could possibly be around. And so you begin to understand that these instructions, when we chew on them, they become a lamp for our feet, a light for our path. They give us direction. And so because of that, the psalmist says this, he goes on, he says, I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your 
righteous laws. I mean, these are actually good. They are right. They are good for us. It's so important that that I've taken an oath that these are going to be my way of life. And then skipping forward a few verses, he says, the wicked have set a snare for me. In other words, the temptation of the world around me is to take a different path. It's to not value these precepts. He says, the wicked have set a snare for me, but I've not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage, which is like an inheritance. They're a blessing. They are a gift. Your statutes are my heritage. They're a gift forever. They are the joy of my heart. What do you mean joy? They're not an impediment. They're not like a no fun policy. No, 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 no. Because as I've meditated on them, as I've chewed on them, the thing I've discovered is that these are actually for me. These are a benefit. These are with my best intention. And so the continuing on, uh, he finishes up this section and says this. He says, my heart is set. My heart is set deep within me. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. This is my path, and I have no intention to change. Wow. Now, here's the thing, right? I said earlier, there are lots of rules for the road. There are lots of places we can go to get our rules from the road. Different states, you know, have them. There are different philosophies, there are different religions, there are different self-help books, and it could be easy to just listen to all this, say, you know, that's nice, again, Seth, you're a pastor, of course you're going to tell us that, of course you're going to tell us, read your Bible, you know, do what it says, That, that makes a lot of sense, right, that's what you would expect me to say. So how is this different from other self-help? How is this different from other religions? How is this different from other philosophies? And the thing that I would say in response to that is this has to do with the God behind the rules for the road. See, one of the most important questions that we need to ask is what's the agenda? What's the agenda of these other philosophies? What's the agenda of the self-help you know, what's the agenda of this religion? What's the agenda? Why are they giving us these rules? Sometimes it's to control, right? We, we just want to control people. Sometimes it's power. We want to feel like we're in control. Sometimes it's wealth. That could be a motivation. So let me ask you, what do you think was God's motivation for giving us rules for the road? This is planted all throughout the pages of Scripture. It's this word right here, love. This is God's motivation. That God is not trying to control you. If he wanted to create a bunch of robots, beep, boop, 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 I mean, he could have created all kinds of robots. He could have (laughs) filled a planet full of robots. He could have. If he was trying to control you, I mean, Jesus, Jesus on earth never forced people to be his followers. If he wanted to control you, he could have controlled you. If he was all about money and wealth, I mean, again, we don't even think, as far as we know, Jesus never passed an offering plate. And one of the reasons Judas betrayed him was because he didn't care enough about money from Judas's point of view. It's not wealth. I mean, his motivation is so clearly stated in the most famous verse of all scripture where Jesus said this himself. He says, for God so, what's that word? Loved. That was his motivation, that he did what? That he gave then his one and only son that he sent Jesus. I mean, Jesus is the undeniable piece of this. And honestly, I mean, you could just discard and disregard everything I've said if it weren't for Jesus. But the problem with Jesus is that his words, his actions, his life is pretty undeniable. In fact, we had a series, Undeniable, this past spring where we talked about how Jesus was a real man who walked the earth. He was crucified on a Roman cross. His followers poured into the streets of Jerusalem weeks later proclaiming that he had come back to life. Jesus, uh, uh, the apostle Paul became the most ardent Jesus supporter and the greatest evangelist the world has ever known. He had once been an oppressor of Christians. He became a leader of Christianity. Jesus' own half-brother, James. James, who at one point in time wanted Jesus committed because he was acting crazy, became a Jesus follower and died proclaiming Jesus was his Lord. And then there's the problem of the empty tomb. I mean, all these historical facts, when they come together, you begin to say, okay, this begins to make a little bit of sense. And it adds validity and veracity to the words of the psalmist and to the pages of scripture. To which you look at that then and say, okay, who is this God? Who is this God who doesn't necessarily want to control me, but that he's for me? 
And when love is the motivation, I am just telling you, it changes things. It changes things because there are principles that our world revolves around. And as I said earlier, the thing about principles is you don't break them. You simply break yourself against them. Which then makes sense of why God, if he truly does love us, why he would preserve this thing for us 2,000 plus years later that we can go back and understand his precepts and that we can look at that and say, this really is a lamp for my feet. This is a guide because he has my best in mind. He wants what's best for me. So for the next couple minutes as we close this out, I want to share with you a process that we used to teach students, I used to teach students, um, to help them because so often we approach the Bible and we're like, I don't even know what to do with this. I don't know where to start with it. I want to read it. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm not sure. So I hope this is helpful for you, regardless of where you are in your journey, on the faith journey. This could be a new practice to try, even if you you know the Bible and you can figure it out. But uh, it, it's, it's all in the acronym SOAP the acronym SOAP. And so each letter stands for a word. The first one is scripture. And it's find time, find time, I'd encourage you to do this every day, find time to read through scripture. Now, we're not talking about a massive portion, not even talking about a chapter necessarily. In fact, let me tell you how I do this. When I'm reading for what I would call devotional purposes, because I want to just hear from God, I read sometimes until something just hits me. Whether it's a phrase, whether it's a command, whether it's something that I don't like, something that makes me uncomfortable, whether it's something that's like, ooh, you know, that, that kind of hits me where I am in life right now or something I've been dealing with. And then when I get to that point, again, it can be a few verses, it can be a chapter, whatever. I mean, there's no rule. I just pause and I stop and then I observe. O stands for observation. Just spend some time and say, okay, what do you think God's saying here? Let's meditate on this a little bit. Let's think about, God, what are you trying to communicate through this? Sometimes I'll take out an index card or a little piece of paper. Uh, I'd suggest doing this in the beginning of the day, early on in your day, because then you can take this index card, this piece of paper with you throughout the day, and you can meditate on it. Again, bring it back in front, pull it out of your pocket, think about it, or set a reminder in your phone. That's another way you can do it. But make an observation. Say, okay, what is going on? And what, what might God be encouraging me to do here, which leads to A, which is application? What, what is the to-do with this? What is the to-do that God wants me to do? How do I respond to this? Sometimes it's hard to know exactly, and so you have to meditate a little longer. Sometimes I've kept the same verse in front of me for two weeks because I've just been wrestling through, God, what does this mean for me? What do, what do you want me to do with this? I know there's something important here that I'm not seeing. So Father, help me, to, help me to understand it. Write that down, write your application down, and then P stands for prayer. And it could be you need to pray and say, God, I don't, know, I don't get this. Help me to do it. Help me to understand it. Help me to do it. God, thank you for preserving your word for 2,000 years so that I can have it here in front of me now to be my light, to shine in front of me, to guide me. And you ask God for strength and, and begin to apply it. And when you do that, you discover, again, a God who doesn't want to control you, but a God who's for you. A God who loves you so much that he preserved it for 2,000 years so that we wouldn't be left figuring out how to live life on this earth. He gave us instructions for it. Now, when it comes to scripture, I'd encourage you to start, you can do the book of Proverbs, which is what we're doing together as a church this summer. In fact, if you scan that QR code, there's a little video tutorial of how to use the Proverbs within our church app. But start somewhere in the New Testament. I would encourage you to stay away from the Old Testament aside from Proverbs, at least if you're new to the journey and just trying to figure it all out. And again, you'll discover an incredible God who's behind it. You know, um, next week is Father's Day. You're welcome, ladies, if you didn't remember. It was Father's Day for next week. Um, And one of the things as a dad, you know, I I just want to be the best dad I can possibly be. And there are times when my kids will come up to me, and I can remember this in childhood when we'd go to our parents, and and we don't have a lot of rules in our house. We don't have a lot of rules for the road, but sometimes my kids will will kind of point a hole or pick out a hole in something like, well, you know, why is this? But, But why, right? The but why. And there are times when it's like, because I said so, dumb kids, go, to, go do something else. You know? or, or there are times when, when I'll look at that and I'll say, yeah, I don't really have a very good reason for that, so let's change it, right? The thing that I have discovered is that we have a perfect Heavenly Father. 
Like, as much as I try to be perfect, as much as I try to not have arbitrary rules just for my own enjoyment or whatever, you know, God doesn't do that. He is so perfect. He is so perfect. His rules for the road are for our benefit. His principles, his precepts are to watch over us and to protect us and to care for us. And when we understand them, when we lean our lives into them, we discover, again, a God who is so for us, so for us, who loves us and who wants the best for us. So would you try for a week, if you don't already do this, if you don't already spend time? Or maybe you need to freshen up your time, and maybe you want to try something new and try the soap, scripture, observation, application, prayer. And just spend some time. See what God wants to speak to you. I'm telling you, God is a speaking God. He communicates, and he wants to communicate with you question is, will you give it the time and will you listen? Seven days. Would you do it for seven days and see what God might want to do in you and through you? And then after seven days, if you don't see any value, you can move on to something else, but try it for seven days and see uh, what it is that God may want to do. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, um, I thank you that this has been preserved for us for so many years. And I thank you that you are a God who loves us so much, that you didn't just leave us in our brokenness, you didn't leave us trying to figure life out, but that you sent your son, you sent Jesus to make a way that we could be forgiven, to make a way that we would know what's right. Thank you for these words, the reminder of how your word is a lamp to our feet that guides us and protects us and watches over us so we don't have to step on the Barbies and the G.I. Joes, but that we... We can move our lives in a direction that's honoring and pleasing to you and that's better for us. Father, give us courage to make the time and discipline and diligence to make the time. Help us to listen. And as we listen, would you speak to us and would we hear? And then would we walk away putting into practice the things that you have for us, for our benefit? We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.